to treat. My pivot to this, Dr. Johnson. So I wanted to um, talk about the distinguished uh, sun lecture. And then, um, Gordon, can you say a few words as, as Mark is looking at these speakers in the past about Dr. Sunt and what he meant to you? Certainly. Um, Dr. Sunt had somewhat of an unusual pathway to get into medicine, having attended West Point uh, for his undergraduate degree, like a number of the other men in his family. He then served in the Korean War and uh, earned two bronze stars for bravery in that battle. And I should add that uh, Frank Borman was one of his best friends uh, throughout West Point. And for those of you who have some memory of history of the space program, Frank Borman was one of the astronauts that went to the moon. And I had the opportunity to meet him several times over the year. So a very impressive man himself. But Dr. Sunt went to medical school at the University of Tennessee, then joined the staff at Mayo Clinic Rochester and became a world leader in all phases of vascular neurosurgery. This was in the pre-endovascular era. Everything was done open. Uh, he was known really, I think, for being a great leader. Uh, he was known for compassionate patient care. He was known for world-class clinical and basic science research and for also training the next generation of residents. So thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Well, Mark, we're so glad to have you here with us today. You know, you can see Dr. Johnson when he did his VA, and we actually sent the CV around so people would know. And uh, this is what we interacted when he was doing his MD PhD at the Harvard Medical School. He was uh, graduating. I came to medical school in 94. He was just graduating, you know, in 1995 from his MD PhD, and we had a chance to interact, and I got a chance to meet him. And then I went to interview at Seattle, and I remember just getting to meet this extraordinary uh, a person who was doing extraordinary work and already becoming a force in organized neurosurgery research, education, patient care. Dr. Wynn was the chair at the time at Seattle. And then I got to see him, of course, going from there back to Harvard as a faculty member, and most recently also as a chair of the department you know, of neurological surgery at the University of Massachusetts. You know, really part of the board of trustees recently also applied for a grant. He asked me to participate and send a letter of support. I was so impressed and, and he's just been so humble to get to know him over the years. Tons of awards. You can actually see the Chancellor's Award on diversity, tons of NIH funding. He's part of the SunPAC Foundation is on the board. I mean, just really, you know, you can see 2007, the NIH Director's New Innovator Award, just an amazing amount of publications, you know, achievements that you can just see right here and see he gets impact on the literature. His H index, you can see the trends over the years. It's just been absolutely fantastic. You know, I would say that for me, what is even more impressive is, is beyond the accolades, beyond the amazing care that he takes for patients, it's just the person behind this, you know, behind a lot of these achievements. It's just a very kind, gentle person who is always there, who anytime that I have asked him for help or advice at our meetings, he's always has a big smile. And that's something that is. Um, it's real and it's something that to me touches me in ways that I cannot even begin to describe. And just uh, to see people at this level of achievement do so many things for, to change the world, it really inspires me, Mark. So we are so excited to have you here with us this morning. We are excited. I told you I wanted to give a big talk to get people excited. You can see that a lot of people are going to meet with you and hopefully establish, build bridges, collaborations, some of the studies that we have and see if we can synergize our efforts, you know. It took me a while to get you here, but you can see what we've been building over the years. It needed to be the right time to have you here. You know, so we're here, we're together. Welcome. Thank you, Alfredo. And um, thanks to everyone for joining this morning. You know, I, I would say that uh, I feel honored to uh, have known uh, Dr. Q for so many years. And he is a pace setter, as all of you know. And um, so I, I actually look to him and try to uh, emulate him. He's like a rocket. And the, the things that you guys uh, are doing there at Mayo are really amazing, especially the global reach uh, that, that you have done. And I know that Dr. Q is a major uh, driver by, behind all of that. And uh, I really appreciate that. So let me, um, let me see if I can share my screen. Green. All 
All right, can you see that? Yeah, we see it now, Mark. Thank you. Great. Beautiful picture. All right. Um, so this is one of the research buildings uh, at the University of Massachusetts. Um, I came to UMass about five years ago, around the same time that Dr. Q headed down to Mayo from Hopkins and uh, established a new residency program here, uh, similar to what you guys have done. And um, so I'm just gonna talk a little bit today about an area that um, I sort of came upon accidentally. I was a, a junior faculty member at the Brigham and the chair of the department, Peter Black, left and I inherited a large uh, practice for idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus, which was a disorder, to be quite honest, that I uh, knew very little about and uh, came to find out that hardly anyone knew anything about it. Uh, but I had a lot of patients with this disorder. And I said, you know, as long as I'm taking care of these patients, I may as well uh, study this disorder. And so I have, over the last uh, eight to 10 years, uh, been working in this, in this area. My original research area is in brain tumors, and I continue to do some work uh, there as well. But you know, I could get excited about just about any area of science, as I'm sure many of you uh, would do the same. And, and this is a very, very interesting area, and, and one which we as neurosurgeons um, will have to, to push forward. So I want to just show you this video. This is a video that I downloaded from YouTube. So this is a gentleman who presented with incontinence, uh, dementia. Oh, hold on just a second. Incontinence, dementia, and difficulty walking. And you can see he shuffles his feet. He really doesn't swing his arms very much. Um, Patients like this are frequently diagnosed with, with Parkinson's disease. This is the same patient after four days of lumbar drainage. So you can see a remarkable uh, improvement there. And it, it is common to see this kind of improvement uh, in the clinic, although not everyone improves as much as this person did. So what what is wrong with him? His incontinence improved about half of these patients, their dementia will improve. So this uh, disorder was discovered in uh, 1965, actually over at uh, Mass General by uh, Hakeem and colleagues. Uh, it's characterized by difficulty walking, cognitive problems and incontinence, something that we see a lot in the elderly population. And if you scan them, you'll find that the ventricles are enlarged. If you do a lumbar puncture, you'll find that the pressure is usually less than 20. Um, this affects about 750,000 Americans, almost a million. About 15% of patients in nursing homes are thought to have NPH, but the vast majority of them are undiagnosed or misdiagnosed in part because many physicians and other caregivers are unfamiliar with this disorder and because it can resemble other disorders like Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease. Interestingly, this usually occurs in people after the age of 60, people who have been normal all of their lives uh, up until this point. And uh, it's called idiopathic because the cause and the cell biology of it are really not known. This is an article published by Cliff Saper, who is the editor of Annals of Neurology, published this in 2017. Um, he argued in this editorial that NPH is not a real disorder, that it does not exist, that it's a manifestation of other disorders. And there are a number of folks uh, out there, uh, neurologists primarily, uh, but some others who don't believe that this is a real disorder. And in fact, when I came to UMass, the chair of neurology asked me, do you think this is real? 
for neurosurgeons, because we treat this and we see people get better all the time, we don't usually ask those questions, but others do. And so we need to really bring science to bear on this in, in order to bring this to the public's attention. So I became interested in NPH and trying to understand what causes it. And I took a variety of different approaches, but one of the approaches that we took was a genetic approach. And that was based on several articles in the literature that reported families where NPH uh, runs in the family. And in those cases where they had done a careful evaluation, it was always autosomal dominant transmission. And you would predict that would be the case. Autosomal recessive disorders tend to be very, very rare. And I told you that 1% of patients over the age of 60, and in fact, about 5% of patients over the age of 75 will have NPH. So it's relatively common, and it's pretty clear that it's not going to be an autosomal recessive uh, disorder. Most cases, of uh, congenital hydrocephalus genetic cases are autosomal recessive. So this, this disorder is, is different than those. And you can see that there are a variety of genes, DNA H14, SMF, SFMBT1, CFAP43 that had been uh, identified and, and thought to be related to this, but all of the studies were very small involving two or three family members. And so it was unclear whether that could be generalized to the larger population of NPH patients, most of whom do not report a family history of NPH. A part of that problem may be because it is uh, rarely diagnosed. And another uh, part of the problem is that many of the patients, um, their uh, parents or grandparents have already passed away by the time they're diagnosed. So, um, trying to understand the family tree in these disorders can be difficult. So we uh, collected DNA from 53 patients who had demonstrated shunt responsive NPH. We did this in three separate groups um, of about 10 to 20 patients each isolated the DNA, did the sequencing, and performed the statistical analysis three separate times in each of these groups. We uh, compared the findings to a public database, the exact database, which contains about 60,000 human genomes. We were looking for genetic alterations that were statistically enriched among these NPH patients. We focused on alterations that were predicted to be uh, damaging, and that occurred in less than 1% of the population. We then experimentally validated those candidates uh, using a variety of techniques. So about 15% of the patients in this group, so eight of the 53 patients had mutations in a gene called CWH43. It was actually two different recurrent mutations. So four patients had the same mutation and then a, another four patients had a different mutation, but all occurring in the same gene and, and were predicted to be damaging. And these were enriched in this group compared to the general population. So we decided to focus on uh, this gene first, we did identify some other genes that were also statistically enriched and we're kind of working our way through those. We looked at the MRI scans of these eight patients uh, with CWH43 mutations, compared those to an age and gender match uh, set of control patients who were asymptomatic. And not surprisingly, the uh, ventricular volume of these patients was uh, significantly increased compared to control patients. Here in panel A is just the Sanger sequencing, uh, confirming what we had seen with the whole exome sequencing. And then in panel B is a diagram of the CWH43 protein. And we've indicated here where the two mutations occur. 
So one of the mutations uh, creates a stop codon and truncates the protein. That's the LU533 uh, terminus, terminal mut mutation. Um, so you lose the C-terminus of the protein. The other one occurs at the far end of the C-terminus. And it's very interesting. It wasn't predicted to be in a functional domain. But if you look carefully, the C-terminus contains a, a sequence, a targeting sequence, the KYFL sequence, which targets CWH43 to the Golgi, which is where it has its primary action. This mutation called a frame shift, it eliminated that targeting sequence and it actually created a new targeting sequence that is a uh, ER, endoplasmic reticulum retention sequence. So it completely, it was predicted to completely change the localization of this protein uh, within the cell. So what is CWH43? It, it turns out that this had not been studied in, in uh, vertebrates. It's only been studied in yeast up to this point. But in yeast, it was shown to be involved in uh, the synthesis of a class of proteins called glycosyl phosphatidylinositol anchored proteins or GPI anchored proteins. This is a family of about 150 proteins in mammals. The, the proteins are attached to the outer surface of the cell membrane by a lipid anchor. And they have many different functions, receptors, adhesion molecules, enzymes, transporters, et cetera. So CWH43 actually incorporates ceramide into the uh, lipid anchor <clears throat> of, of this protein. And uh, one study showed that the incorporation of ceramide into the lipid anchor determines whether the GPI anchored protein in yeast is going to be on the cell membrane or on the cell wall. So it may serve some targeting function. This is <clears throat> a recent paper by Vogt et al where they actually studied this and they showed that the um, lipid anchor regulates the transglycosylation of these GPI anchored proteins. And through that process, they are then targeted either to the cell membrane or to the uh, cell wall of yeast. So again, I just wanna point out these two mutations both disrupt the targeting sequence of CWH43 to the Golgi. So we examine this, these are HeLa cells, um, and we have uh, knocked out the endogenous CWH43, and then we overexpress uh, a GFP fusion protein with CWH43. So in the left-hand column, we have labeled the endoplasmic reticulum with a marker, RFP cal reticulum, okay? And you can see that the GFP and the cal reticulum are co-localized in the endoplasmic reticulum, which is not surprising because that's where it is translated into protein. And then in the second column, we've labeled the Golgi with a marker called Golgi 97. And you can see in these cells that the wild type CWH43 co-localizes with the Golgi, which is what one would expect. In the third column and the fourth column, we've taken uh, fusion proteins harboring the NPH associated mutation, human mutation, overexpress those. And you can see that both of those disrupt the localization of CWH43 to the Golgi. So we expect that these mutations would disrupt the function of CWH43, whatever that function may be in, in uh, vertebrate cells. We don't know, uh, we didn't know at that time. So why is this important? So uh, this is a uh, figure from a paper by Zerzolo et al, where they're looking at polarized epithelial cells. And they're looking at the trafficking of G GPI anchored proteins in these cells. It turns out that the GPI anchored proteins tend to traffic to the apical membrane of these cells. And that trafficking is controlled at the level of the Golgi. 
it depends on cholesterol uh, in glycosylation and remodeling of the lipid anchor. So we hypothesized that perhaps CWH43 would be involved in this process, just as it is involved in the targeting of GPI anchor proteins in yeast. So to uh, study that, we used a technique which has been uh, widely used to study GPI anchor proteins. It involves using a detergent, Trident X114, to isolate a lipid uh, fraction from cells, and the GPI anchored proteins uh, are enriched in that lipid fraction. So in the first three lanes, uh, those are lanes from wild type CWH43 cells. And then we use CRISPR-Cas9 to make two different knockout cell lines in order to control for off-target effects, okay? And what you can see is that um, the GPI anchored protein, in this case, CD59, is localized primarily in the lipid phase, the Triton X114 fraction in the wild type cells. And if you overexpress either a control GFP or wild type CWH43 or the mutant CWH43, it really doesn't affect that. But if you look at the two knockout cell lines, you can see that the uh, GPI anchored protein is uh, greatly decreased in the, lipid in, in the lipid phase as if it is not being targeted there. And if we overexpress a wild type CWH43, we can rescue that effect. That's shown in the second row, all right? And that the second set of three, you can see now when we overexpress CWH43, we see more CD59 in the, in the lipid phase. But if we overexpress the mutant form of CD, uh, CWH43, uh, we're unable to rescue that. And we were able to reproduce that in both cell lines. So CWH43 mutations alter the targeting of CD59 and other GPI anchored proteins uh, to these membrane compartments. So what about CWH43 in the brain? So this is data from the Allen Brain Atlas. You're looking at uh, NC2 mRNA, and you can see that uh, there's increased expression of CWH43 in the choroid plexus and the ependymal cells of the ventricle. It's also expressed in select subpopulations of neurons uh, in, elsewhere uh, in the brain. But there is a high concentration here. And um, by immunocytochemistry and panel A, uh, we've uh, stained the ventricular zone uh, for CWH43, and you can see that it's localized primarily in ependymal cells. We uh, identify those ependymal cells by labeling the cilia with a marker for uh, uh, acetylated tubulin, which is in green there. In B, this is just a higher uh, magnification view. And you can see that the CWH43 is primarily in the cell body, but there's actually some CWH43 present in the cilia themselves. In C, we've actually cultured these ependymal cells and uh, label the cilia again with acetylated tubulin, and you can see that there is CWH43 in those uh, cilia. So we um, then use CRISPR-Cas9 to generate uh, two different mouse lines where we incorporated this CWH43 mutation in the mice. And we found that the, the mice do in fact uh, develop enlarged uh, ventricles. They're otherwise normal. And if you inject dextran into the lateral ventricle, uh, within a few minutes, it circulates throughout the uh, CSF. So this is a communicating hydrocephalus. The mice do not get sick and die. They live a full life. They are fertile and reproduce normally, but they develop uh, hydrocephalus. This data in, in A just quantifies that where we measure the ventricular volume in uh, either the heterozygous mice or the homozygous mice from two different cell lines, uh, mouse lines. And you can see that the ventricles are enlarged in the heterozygous mice, which is good. We were very happy to see that because all of the mutations were heterozygous in the patients. 
We also analyze their gait and you can find very subtle changes uh, in their uh, gait and also uh, defects in uh, strength and balance with rotorot testing. So these mice develop an NPH-like syndrome. So we wanted to understand what was going on, what was the cause for this? And uh, Alfredo, I know you will recognize this picture because you've worked uh, in this area. <laughs> and uh, what we found is that the, the cilia, actually, if you look at them with electron microscopy with uh, transmission EM, they look normal. The structure is normal. Their length is normal. And we actually measure the cilia beat frequency and that is normal. But their number was decreased by about 20%. So it's just a subtle change in the, in the number of cilia. We also looked to see whether there was evidence for mislocalization or, or abnormal targeting of GPI anchored proteins uh, in the brain and in, a, in another uh, epithelial tissue, the kidney. And we found indeed uh, that was the case. In the wild type mice, you can see that the uh, GPI anchored protein CD59 is localized to the lipid phase, as you would expect, both in the brain and the kidney. But in the um, mutant mice, you can see that the expression is, is decreased in both kidney and brain. So CWH43 mutation uh, alters the localization of, of these GPI anchored proteins in vivo. And then finally, we wanted to see whether there was any effect on the targeting, the apicobasal targeting of these uh, proteins in vivo. And so we looked at ependymal cells that's in the top row and core plexus, which is in the bottom row uh, from the wild type and two different uh, mutant mouse lines. And what you can see is that the CD59 is localized primarily to the apical surface in both choroid plexus and in the ependymal cells. If you mutate CWH43, it actually uh, tends to localize at the basal lateral surface. So there's a complete redistribution of uh, these GPI anchored proteins uh, in these cells. So we think that this is the, at least the, the, the beginning of an understanding of the uh, molecular basis for NPH in patients who have these mutations. I don't have time to talk about some uh, other work that we've done showing that this mutation alters the glycosylation of L1 cam, which is a cell adhesion molecule that is the most, uh, is most commonly uh, or often mutated in congenital hydrocephalus. It's the most common cause of X-linked congenital hydrocephalus. So this may be at least part of what's going on there. So let me just summarize what, uh, what we've gone over. So over on the left is the normal state. And hang on a second, I'm gonna close the sun shining in my eyes. The sun just came up, so. That, that's, that's good, Mark, that the sun just came up because I thought it would be like overcast over there in Boston already in the New England area. <laughs> Beautiful, very opportune that the sun came out right now when you show in this picture. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, so in the normal state, uh, normal ventricular size, normal gait, uh, continence, and memory function, CWH43 is localized to the Golgi, where it modifies the lipid anchor of GPI anchored proteins and targets them to lipid microdomains uh, in the cell membrane. This is necessary for these proteins to be uh, properly targeted uh, to the apical surface of epithelial cells. Um, when that targeting is appropriate, then through some mechanism that we're still working on trying to understand, um, you get normal ventricular size. In the case of the uh, patients who have these CWH43 mutations, CWH43 does not localize to the Golgi and is therefore unable to modify the lipid anchor of the GPI anchored proteins. They do not uh, accumulate in these lipid microdomains. Uh, this leads to mislocalization of the proteins uh, in, in an apical basal way. 
in the ventricular epithelium and ultimately leads to decreased number of cilia and uh, hydrocephalus. So um, I will stop there and take any questions that you may have. Well, thank you, Dr. Johnson. Thank you. I, you know, we're just thinking about, I think I have, a, I see a hand already up. I ask you guys to please, I see Ugo and Anna who work in, uh, in, in subventricular zone and CSF, but I see Dr. Miller already. So if anybody else has any questions, we can raise your hand, it'll be coming up. And I see Andres. So let's go with Dr. Miller. Go ahead, Dr. Miller, who is one of our neural interventional radiologists, Mark. So go ahead, Dr. Miller. Fascinating talk, tremendous work, an interesting disease that has, 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 has baffled people for a long time. I too have had an interest in this since a long time back in the 80s when I first um, sort of encountered the disease and the treatment with Dr. Roberto Harris, who had an interest when I was at Minnesota. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really interesting that this is one of the few treatable causes of dementia. And uh, the, 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 the findings are so dramatic, we've always sort of chalked things up to the fact that you fix the pressure and the symptoms improve. But it seems that, that sometimes the, uh, the, uh, the uh, um, gait and the uh, incontinence problems improve more than the cognitive things. Is there some reason that you, I mean, it's, that this lags, I mean, if it's purely a pressure phenomenon, I would sort of expect things to all, all get a lot better. And, and people's response to this is quite variable. Do you have, a, a, do you have any thoughts about what other, what, what else may be going on that, that, that for some of these people just don't respond? Because if it's a pure pressure phenomenon, fixing the pressure should make most of these people respond a lot better than some of them do. Right, yeah, I, I don't think it's a pure pressure phenomenon. And you know, people have, have studied uh, NPH a fair amount, neurosurgeons have, and there's some other changes that, that they see. For example, changes in cerebrovascular reactivity and, and blood flow in particular. And um, I don't understand exactly why that is. I have some hypotheses, but I do think that that is involved. Um, and we, we have some early uh, evidence that there are other changes in the brain changes for example, in the uh, uh, dendritic arborization of neurons uh, in various parts of the brain, which I think may help to explain why these patients, um, they, you know, the, why their gait improves more than their, than their memory function. So we're trying to under, understand that, but it's much more, you know, for years and years and years, neurosurgeons have just been very, uh, physiology oriented, very structural in our thinking. And I, I think we need to, to uh, think, uh, go beyond that, okay? There's so much biology here, molecular and cellular biology, the, the CSF system, the circulation, the, the reabsorption, the purpose of it, why is it even there? You know, we shun it every day, every day. You know, it looks clear, it looks like water, We've done some proteomics, over a thousand proteins in that CSF, and they are not just there passively, they are there for a reason. So there are a lot of things about this uh, aspect of the brain that we don't uh, understand. It's much, much more complex uh, than it appears at first glance. Amazing, thank you. thank you. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Let's give it to uh, Andre Ramos, Dr. Ramos, go ahead. So uh, first I wanted to share with Dr. Johnson his uh, plaque for, for today. And, and we thank you for presenting the, the Sant Distinguished Lecture with us. We'll, uh, we'll send it to you over in the next few days. Um, thank you, thank and, you so much. And then I, I did have a question. So have you looked into or, or maybe noticed uh, any any decrease in the number of cilia with age, and do you think uh, uh, you know accumulation of, of CSF could be in part due to a decrease in the flow of CSF? Uh, have you? So uh, so yes, we have noticed that. In fact, maybe Alfredo reported that. So a number of people have reported that. Um, and we have observed that in older mice compared to younger mice. So I certainly think that that uh, probably plays a role. You know, um, there are many investigators who have studied hydrocephalus 
due to a whole lot of different causes. And what they find almost uniformly is that if you disrupt the cilia, you will get hydrocephalus. Uh, the question is why? And the thought has been, uh, perhaps this has to do with um, CSF stasis and accumulation of CSF. But I actually don't think that's true. <laughs> okay, it's more complicated, much more complicated than that. You know, there are other studies which show that the bulk flow of CSF is actually driven by the cardiac cycle and the respiratory cycle. And in those mice, you know, I showed you a picture where we inject the dextran into the ventricle. I don't know if you noticed, but I said the, within a few minutes, the uh, dye has circulated throughout the whole CSF uh, ventricular system. So there's no obstruction to CSF flow and the CSF flow is very rapid. The pressure is not large. It's very different than obstructive hydrocephalus. So exactly what's going on there um, is unclear. We're trying to figure that out, but it's not uh, just that the CSF is not flowing. I do think yeah. that there are changes in the CSF flow, but so don't misunderstand me. There's a little subtlety there, but I don't think it's because the CSF just can't go anywhere and it's building up in the ventricle. That's, that's not the case. And in fact, you will notice in children, who have enlarged ventricles, if you put a shunt in them, their ventricles will usually get smaller. If you shunt a patient with NPH, you look at the CT scan, the patient is better. The ventricles are still huge. If you do a careful study, you may detect a 5% you know, change of ventricular volume. There's something else uh, going on. It, it's, it's not the usual things. And I, I pivot right now, then I'm going to go to Dr. Suarez. I mean, I was thinking about the beautiful studies that you did. I, I put something in relationship to anatomy. We, we as surgeons are very driven by anatomy. And I think what Dr. Johnson is going beyond the gross anatomy, he's going into the cellular anatomy and in, in understanding how cells you know, interact with each other, how proteins interact with each other, how genetics plays a role in predisposing these potential animals to this diseases and these conditions. And I think the other thing for me is of relevance, and I put something in the chat is how does the role, how does cancer play a role or how does this potentially exacerbate cancer? And right now, we, you and I take care of a lot of patients with gliomas and we, when we see their ventricles growing, we say, oh, hey, yeah, no, it's the radiation, it's the chemo, the brain is shrinking, but the reality is that we don't understand and we don't know how to manage that and how potentially managing that can play a, a positive role in us fighting yeah, so these are the things that I'm sure Dr. Johnson is exploring. And I'm hoping that with our team, we'll get to work on that more. So I feel yeah. now to Paola. Go ahead. And then, and then, Mark, I want you to make a comment about that. But go ahead, Paola. Good morning, Dr. Johnson. Thank you very much for your talk. It was amazing. Uh, I'm Paola Mir. I'm a research fellow at Dr. Q's lab. And I have a couple of questions. The first one is, can, it's because I don't know, do you... Is there a way to measure the opening pressure in your animal model? And the second one is a hot topic that I'm uh, particularly interested in uh, neurosciences is the lymphatic system and all the CSF um, dynamics that have been related to the lymphatic system. Have you, do you have any theories or have you looked into the relationship of the lymphatic system with uh, MPH? Thank you very much. Right, so uh, for the first question, so we have not uh, tried to measure the opening pressure in these animals, although we could certainly do that. You know, we routinely are injecting things into the ventricle, uh, you know, for our studies. And so one could do that. I, I would say that, as I, as I mentioned, these animals behave very, very differently than many of the hydrocephalus animal models that uh, have been published in that uh, they have a full life. So many of those models, the animals uh, die in the perinatal period or within a few weeks of birth. Um, and, you know, by analogy, they mimic uh, uh, children who are born with obstructive hydrocephalus. Um, these animals are mo much more like uh, patients who develop NPH at a, at a later time in life, they, they are actually fine. 
Okay, they don't lose weight. They uh, reproduce normally. They, you know, if you look at them, they look completely normal. It's only after you start to investigate do you find that they have these these deficits. With respect to the glymphatic system, yeah, you, you know, it, anyone, how can you not <laughs> be fascinated by that? If you study anything that has to do with CSF, you have to do that. So yes, we have been looking at that and trying to understand how that changes in the context of NPH. Um, I think, you know, any changes that we see, I think it's a downstream phenomenon. So, uh, you know, we, are, we have two goals. One is to understand this process from soup to nuts. And then the other would be to try to figure out a better way to treat it. Because, you know, I often say to my patients, rarely does placing a shunt completely cure all the symptoms. They may get 50% better, 75% better, but their gait, their balance may still be a little off. Their memory may not improve as much as we would like, right? Um, so there, you know, everything is not quite right again, just by draining that fluid. So we're trying to understand, um, you know, what, what's going on there? What's really wrong? Um, and is there a place along that path that we could intervene using some different approach? Beautiful. And, and, and Dr. Johnson, Mark, comment a little bit about the way you're thinking also with brain cancer. I'm sure you've been thinking yeah. a lot about this. Sure. You know, and then I'm going to go to Tito and then to Gabriel and we're going to wrap it up. Go for it. So, you know, I think, you know, um, we haven't studied this a lot, although we have a plan to study it, right? But you can only yes, do something once. You. But, but the, the, the thing is that um, not everyone who is treated for uh, brain cancer develops uh, an NPH-like syndrome or secondary NPH. Some do and some don't. I think that uh, based on our studies, there may be a genetic predisposition to, uh, to develop that. For anyone who's taking care of brain uh, tumor patients, you should always have this in the back of your mind. After the patient has had their radiation and chemotherapy, if you see them start to get the dwindles, you should always ask, could this be NPH? Some patients, if you place a shunt, will improve. And if you don't think about that, many people think, oh, it's just progression of the tumor. Um, and, uh, and patients uh, you know, decline needlessly in those situations. So I, you know, I, I don't know why this occurs, but I, I do think it's probably related to a genetic predisposition, perhaps a susceptibility to the treatment that we're providing, right? Which mm -hmm. does have mm -hmm. a deleterious effect, I'm sure, on those ciliated uh, ependymal cells. So I, I think that's probably the origin, the radiation mm -hmm. effect on the ventricular epithelium or something like that, uh, chemotherapy effect there. And then the other things follow. But the question is, why doesn't everybody get that? And I think there may be some predisposition. Yeah. Yeah, and I was thinking about that. That was the paper that made the cover that, that the one you saw, the Celia, the beautiful uh, scanning and electromicroscopy figure that he showed. We had one like that that made a cover. And it's really fascinating. So Tito's an expert in hydrocephalus as well. He's from Colombia. He spent a lot of time with the Hakim. He introduced me to the Hakim family. We become very good friends. Gabriel. Also from Colombia, so I'm going to have both of them ask the question. Then we'll wrap it up. Tito, you go first. Thank you, Dr. Q. Hi, Dr. Johnson. Thank you for your lecture. Yeah. This is really groundbreaking data for us, and of course, it brings a lot of questions. But I want to uh, just ask you. Um, I work with Dr. Quinones and Dr. Rigamonte at Hopkins, and we develop an animal model of chronic hydrocephalus that is very similar to you in regards that they develop uh, the symptoms over time. This is in adult hydrocephalus, and you can actually don't uh, see their symptoms uh, with the naked eye. You have to use the catwalk, you know, all these uh, instruments in the behavioral labs to be able to detect all these subtle um, onset of symptoms that, uh, that resemble hydrocephalus. But this is, this is a model that was uh, done uh, uh, surgically. We just blocked the arachnoid um, fenestrations uh, by injecting calin in the convexities. 
So, but your model is much more accurate in the sense that it, it affects the, 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 the cellular and molecular level of the, of the animals by itself. So what I wanted to ask is, have you done a serial imaging over time of, of your animal model? Because we did so, and we uh, defined very, uh, a lot of uh, similarities with, in regards of the, of the CSF flow, what the stroke volume. So we were able to look at the actual uh, stroke volume in the aqueduct over time during the development of the actual hydrocephalus. And that's one of the questions. And the second one, can you do like a, a CSF tracing of the, of, the, of the flow of the CSF uh, with your animal model? I think that's something that many people is very interested in on because I can, I can think that in your model at the beginning, they don't have uh, much disturbances in the CSF flow. Uh, with no symptoms, but then later on over time, you know, all the changes start appearing. So that's very important to actually uh, see what are the physiological and anatomical or microanatomical changes of the CSA flow at the beginning, later, you know. Right. So, um, so we have been studying the CSF flow. It's a little difficult to study it in the traditional way because by the time we, so we've been studying that by injecting a fluorescent dextran into the CSF, but by the time we <laughs> finish the injection, sacrifice the animal and look at the brain, it's like everywhere. It goes so fast. So, you know, we, um, you know, right now we're down to five minutes and, mm -hmm. and we find that the, the, the tracer is already in the subarachnoid space and the paravascular spaces. So um, it is, it's going to be challenging to do that. I think probably if we were to use a radionuclide or something like that, where we could look at concentrations, the concentration of the tracer, we might be able to get more, um, more information uh, from it, but it's it, in a mouse brain, it's, it's not trivial, right? Yeah. You know, you can, you can take an explant and you can look at the ability of the cilia to move the tracer along with the explant, but that's a completely different. Yes. Yeah. And, and we, we did try that. And of course we, that's, that's the reason why we use rats because they have a much larger brain. Yeah. And yeah, with that, we were able to do in vivo, like imaging high quality in 11.7 Tesla's MRIs at, 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 in Brooker, you know, at Kennedy Krieger. Yeah. So we got very, very nice imaging, uh, very clear, very sharp. Uh, but I guess, I don't know if you can do this in Iraq. I think that will be, that will be, that will bring a lot of information if you can just do this in a larger on yeah. model. I'm I mean, it's a slightly different situation, uh, but I think using your technique might be the way to do it, right? In, in, the, in the animal model that you have, you have purposefully scarred the subarachnoid space. Mm. As far as we know, in these animals, I mean, we, the subarachnoid space is not scarred. And in fact, mm -hmm. you know, you see rapid uh, circulation of the tracer. In human studies where people have used MRI and, and they report or, uh, or radionuclide and they do report CSF stasis, right? Um, or slower CSF circulation. But, you know, the one confounding factor there is that the volume of the CSF is much larger. So you would expect that the fraction of CSF that circulates would be lower. Right, so it, is that is that the cause or is that just an effect? Effect, yeah. Right, mm -hmm. that's the, the the problem. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. You. Thank you, Tito. One more question from Gabriel, and then I also see that Dr. Fermo is going to meet who leads and train with us at Hopkins, who leads the high level. We're very interested in figure how we're going to collaborate and and, yeah. and build bridges. So, Gabriel. Take it away, please. Let's keep it brief and then we're going to wrap it up. And so, so many people fascinated, Mark. You can see everybody stay online and stuff. Go ahead. This is, this is not, it's more the, a common congratulations, Dr. Johnson, because uh, here we in uh, Colombia, uh, we still are uh, telling that this is a uh, Hakim 
syndrome, you know, the, the NPH. <laughs> and we, of course, believe in that disease. Yeah. And we pay a lot of attention on looking for patients because of the influence of Dr. Hakim, many right. talks, many conferences. Uh, but the level of your research is something really amazing. And of course, we need to, to, to uh, understand more about that disease and how right now maybe we can have a marker or something like that in order to, to look at patient and try to figure out in many of patients that look similar to that NPH syndrome and maybe has or not. Uh, so congratulations and thank you very much for sharing your research and uh, we need to look uh, those amazing uh, developments of that disease. Thank you very much. And, Thank and you, one uh, more uh, thing, yeah, Mark. This is this is amazing. So this is uh, Henry. It's also one of our applicants for rest. And I show this because he just was texting with me. He says, "Oh my God, look at this protein that Dr. Johnson studied." So Henry, tell Dr. Johnson what you have right here. <laughs> Good morning, Dr. Johnson. It's uh, an honor to to meet you. Uh, well, we were just talking, Dr. Q, and uh, I just found this. Uh, he was talking about what's the role of this protein in gliomas, um, uh, we found these um, results using the TCGA that there are significant differences in the expression level in gliomas between the different grades. Uh, it's just something that we just did right now. Just wanted to share maybe this we'll, with you. Maybe we'll use the expertise of Mark Henry too when we're trying, we're, we're putting this manuscript together so that way he can teach us more and we can build bridges. I always believe in collaborations and yeah. figuring ways and putting manuscripts together, put it in context because of making the importance and relevance. So Mark, we just wanted to show you that. Oh, that's beautiful. And everybody, <laughs> you're so great. And you see, you know, also from Gabriel, from Bucaramanga, he's doing a course on November 6th. I'm sure after today, he's gonna invite you to give a lecture in the future about this. You'll see this is how we're, building bridges, he's already smiling. Yeah. He's already planning the next year course, <laughs> you know, so it's great. So we are Absolutely. very, very excited. I think that uh, this has been such a strength for us to be able to connect people, all of you guys. And you guys are, we are like the neurons and we're, we're doing this creating synapses between all our brains. So many people that stay online, as you can see, we, you and I have a meeting and then you're gonna meet the fellows and then the residents. My time with you, I, I, I see you at the meetings and stuff. I just wanted to catch up with you for a few minutes, but yeah. thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. On behalf of our team, on behalf of our patients, on behalf of science, on behalf of the world for the things that you're doing. And uh, have a great day, everybody. Uh, Mark and I, we're going to go into another meeting and, uh, and then uh, we look forward to seeing you guys all on Friday. Great. Thank Friday. you. <laughs> I'll see you in the next meeting, Mark. Okay. <laughs>